Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I'm not sure where in the world some of you are dialing in from, but hello from Sydney, Australia. To kick off, I'm going to introduce myself and Commission Factory. My name is Zane McIntyre, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Commission Factory, and now also the managing director of AWIN APAC. This is a pre-recorded session, and I will be um, available to take your questions when you're ready. Commission Factory was born in 2011 from a need within the APAC region to bring to market an affiliate network that would cater to SMEs all the way up to enterprise clients. After all, a third of all e-commerce in Australia alone is through these smaller SMEs. And we announced two weeks ago that we were acquired by one of the world's largest affiliate networks, AWIN, headquartered in London and Berlin, and with offices in 15 locations around the world and over 1,000 employees in different locations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Between ourselves and AWIN, we work with over 230,000 verified and active affiliates from around the globe and connect our advertisers with over 1 million websites. The APAC region represents enormous growth, not only in e-commerce, but an inevitable but still significant shift in terms of individuals' media consumption um, going online. And for many of these people, this will be a permanent shift in behavior. So you can see we work with some amazing brands already, and this is only continuing to grow and more rapidly since COVID-19 reared its ugly head. When many brands reduced or removed entirely investment in media spend that didn't make sense when the world um, shifted online. And that leads nicely into why affiliate marketing has become a high priority for many brands and the value it adds when connecting with consumers. Affiliate marketing continues to enjoy rising popularity with leading advertisers. And this is largely due to its performance-based nature, its cost effectiveness. And with 81% of brands around the world utilizing affiliates as part of their strategy, it's reasonable to assume it's an important one. Even the likes of Amazon have utilized affiliate marketing through their Amazon Associates program. And I will also credit them for pioneering the industry as they were one of the first major players to utilize affiliate marketing and bring it to the mainstream. Affiliate marketing still ranks extremely high when it comes to return on ad spend, which is a healthy 16 to 1, meaning for every $1 spent on the channel, advertisers on average generate $16 in revenue. Outpaced only by email marketing, which is around 30 to 1 return on ad spend, and which you might imagine makes sense considering email marketing is a cheap form of marketing when you're sending out emails to your existing database. 15% of all media spend is currently being attributed to the affiliate channel. As we close off 2020, which I'm sure many are keen to do, it will be interesting to see how this number increased during a time when non-transparent and non-attributable marketing spend shifted to the affiliate channel. And according to a Forrester consulting study on US affiliate marketing spending patterns, total affiliate marketing spend is predicted to grow by about a robust 10.1% annually through to 2020. Once again, this will be an interesting figure to revisit once we close off the year and see if this growth was outpaced during unprecedented times. For the 19% of brands um, that are not yet utilizing affiliate marketing, I would like to give a brief overview of what it is. Affiliates connect with the right brands for their audience via our platform. They easily generate trackable links to the advertiser from their website, blog, or content. Any visits from their site to the advertiser are tracked back to the affiliate and the affiliate receives a commission for approved sales. Affiliate networks have the benefit of the data and insights we gain from interacting with so many marketing channels, affiliate types and advertiser categories. The type of network insights we have access to, I'll demonstrate here. So during Black Friday, 19% of network sales originated from smartphones, but the clothing sector rose to 26%. 7 a.m. is prime smartphone hour when sales driven via smartphone reach 63%. Unsurprisingly, younger age brackets are up to 50% more likely to access the internet on their smartphone. 
bloggers, content, and social media drives one in three sales. And bloggers have to drive 12 times as many clicks in order to secure a sale compared to a typical coupon portal. So here I would like to just go through a few numbers. Um, in Brazil, it's typical for brands to manage influencers directly. So when anyone suggested to Sephora that it manage their influencer partnerships, the brand jumped at the chance to streamline its approach. To ensure the influencers were aligned with Sephora's objectives and familiar with the affiliate model, an educational project was initiated to support them. In all, there were nine different elements to this project. A welcome pack, brand guidelines, editorial content, um, deep link education, product gifting, uh, voucher, coupon code sharing, CPA rate introduction, CPC top up payments, and exclusive events. 20 hand picked um, influencers formed an exclusive group that Sephora and AWIN and Commission Factory would support. And these affiliates would be rewarded additional commission if any of a trio of criteria were met. And that was conversion rate, sales volume, brand fit. If one criteria was met, an additional 2% um, commission was offered. And if two were met, this would rise to 3%. If all three were met, up to 3.5% commission was available. Long-term brand value, thanks to the new format of their influencer partnerships, Sephora forged strong bonds with this exclusive group and witnessed a surge in value over the first 12 months of the initiative. 6.8 million combined audience reach of the 20 influencers, 60,000 uh, clicks generated by them in the campaign, and a return on ad spend of 11 to 1. More insights that we have um, for another very uh, popular sector for, for our networks is travel. So 60% is the portion of airline sales that are driven by price comparison sites on desktops. Almost four in every 10 clicks are driven by content affiliates in Brazil's travel sector. Sweden's consumers boast the highest average spend in the travel sector. And the US tops the markets with the most active travel affiliates and publishers. So insight and trend analysis is done frequently within affiliate networks for the benefit of our advertisers and publishers, as we're always looking for new and exciting opportunities for our clients. During the pandemic, the travel sector has been hit especially hard, but our research is showing that now is the time for the travel sector to start re-engaging with their affiliates and content creators, as there are signs that there is a significantly strong and growing pent-up demand for travel. In recent surveys, it was found that one in two people in a APAC are eager or very eager to travel now. And the findings from the study align with the travel search interest, where in just three months, APAC has recovered around 50% of its pre-COVID-19 levels in terms of um, search queries and trends online. This shows positive signs that people are interested in testing the waters of future travel and are looking for information on how and when they could be jetting off on their next vacation while still keeping the health situation in mind. And that means that as countries start opening up, people will be eager to get out and travel businesses must be ready to meet these potential customers with useful information that will help them plan. Using these insights and studies, we have already begun advising our travel sector clients on the potential of reopening their affiliate programs or how they are offering flexibility to customers when it comes to booking so they can start their travel plans again with confidence. It's sometimes misunderstood that affiliate marketing is a channel unto itself and, and simply one part of your marketing strategy. And to some extent that can be true. But as I demonstrated previously with how affiliate networks were able to intersect with social media and influencers and creating bespoke campaigns measured on a performance basis, it paints a picture that affiliate marketing is not so much a single discipline, but at a crossroads and overlapping to many others. The marketing technology choices are so many, so varied, and continually more and more are coming into existence. From 2011, when we first launched Commission Factory, the marketing technology landscape was made up of only about 150 key players. Fast forward nine years, and there are now approximately 8,000 marketing technology players available to brands. 
So no, this is not a map of Middle Earth, but a relatively accurate number of all the marketing technologies and services available to brands and e-commerce. It is interesting to note here that whilst you can't see the small province of affiliate marketing technologies, it has been categorized as commerce and sales. And this is a point that is sometimes made that because of the performance nature of affiliate marketing, it is sometimes classed as an after sales channel where the sale has already been made and revenue generated before you have to consider any cost of acquisition or marketing spend. So many marketing technologies classed as advertising and promotion, social and relationships and commerce and sales will intersect, intersect with affiliate, which brings me to my next point. When talking channels, it's not necessarily untrue for us to be regarded as a channel, but it may not be accurate to regard affiliate as a vertical channel. Really, it's a payment mechanism, and it's a horizontal model into which lots of other channels and activity can plug into. And we're already doing this and have done so for many years, whether it be the different types of models such as cashback, retargeting, card abandonment, and the above-mentioned verticals such as display, influences, conversion rate optimi optimization, um, and all of those that the affiliate model plays into nicely. So we would propose that affiliate marketing is not so much a vertical channel, but a horizontal one where all of these tools and disciplines can plug into and take advantage of the performance payment mechanism that exists already and combine many of the different constituents. By utilizing the full suite of what affiliate can facilitate, you can see that it would be unfair to class affiliate as a channel made up entirely of discounting and incentive, but many moving parts and many touch points along the path to conversion. Which leads me to the value of affiliate marketing, as many have come to understand it, and some of the misgivings and understandings around certain affiliate types. I've been in the industry for quite some time now, nearly half of my time on this earth, and I've seen the many changes in sentiment and perceptions around affiliate marketing over the years. And it seems misconceptions and scrutiny are cyclical in nature. While scrutiny is healthy for any form of marketing and the value and returns they generate should always be monitored, misconceptions on the other hand are not so healthy, if not counterproductive. So I'd like to delve into two of the uh, least understood means of promotion that the CEO of AWIN Group, Mark Walters, presented not too long ago. And it's a valuable case study for the value that incentive sites and discount codes can provide and the far more influential role they play than first assumed. For those aware of or already utilizing the affiliate channel, you may regard it as simply a mechanism of conversion. And that's definitely true to some extent. We know that the affiliate channel is generally an expert at converting traffic, largely thanks to the incentive-based activity of discount and cashback strategies that these affiliate types have mastered. And looking at the aggregated data here across a number of retailers using third-party attribution tools such as SingleView, we can see how more revenue is generated on a last click basis from affiliate than any other channel, almost 30%. And looking at these results, it would be natural that some are led to the assumption that affiliates are cannibalizing the sales of other channels <clears throat> and the perception that is a gold hanger channel and not contributing a value of its own. However, when we start to take a closer look at the overall contributions of affiliates, the larger proportion of activity over 70% is made up of either solo conversions, initiating sales as the very first touch point, or as a mid-funnel player, interacting with other channels to help the customer along their way to converting somewhere else. From these results, we can discern that there is clearly a level of unrecognized contribution going on that is frequently neglected by assumptions made about the wider channel. And we can even look specifically at the value of cashback and discount code affiliates, affiliate types that have defined for many people the channel's reputation for cannibalizing sales. A fantastic example of this misconception being an unfounded one comes from the analysis of a major European confectionery brand through their cashback and discounting strategy, further supported again by third-party attribution support. And I'm reiterating third-party attribution here as a means that data was collated without any prejudice on the part of the affiliate network. Typically, they saw the presence of code or cashback offer in the path to conversion. 
had a profoundly positive impact on the eventual conversion and improving their average basket value enormously. And in the new world of e-commerce and commerce, it's going to be more important than ever right now to be smart in using such discounting strategies. As recession set in across the world, many retailers are resorting to slashing prices in an attempt to shift stock that has sat in their warehouses throughout the lockdown, unsold, and which now needs to be shifted as quickly as possible. In the UK, the British Retail Consortium recently revealed that retailers had dropped their prices by 2.4% in a bid to sell stock and incite shoppers to buy their goods. This represented the biggest monthly price drop witnessed in the country since 2006. And from a consumer point of view, we know that confidence will be low and the need to look around for deals and discounts will match the experience of the last recession where a discount culture really established itself online. The chart here from 2015 shows the survey response to how shoppers' habits changed during the 2008 recession. Importantly, the majority of respondents said these discount habits would remain even after the economy improved. And we know that many of these shoppers will now be familiar with finding discounts online. Working with incentive partners more strategically can mean the difference between a sale being profitable or not. And by understanding their value properly by looking at the data, you can embrace these promotional models with confidence, ensuring that your brand can be found in the online spaces where shoppers are searching. And as we see so much e-commerce spend going to the large global players such as Amazon, any sale discounted or not is one less sale in their already substantial coffers. Now that shoppers have this enormous resource at this, that they're disposable when making purchasing decisions, it's important to understand how the consumer has changed over time and the role that affiliates play in an age of consumer disloyalty, where they can be coerced and subverted by the many influences on their path to conversion. This dynamic between consumers and brands has radically altered, and this is largely down to the effects of the internet. The web has empowered individuals, giving them more choice and control over every faucet of their lives. Whether you need a new bank, a new job, or even a new lover, all of these things are attainable now with the click of a few buttons. And shopping is no different. E-commerce provides more choice, more control over where and how consumers spend their money. And in doing so, it has eroded the loyalty that any consumers might have had towards any one brand. So let's take a look at how this relationship between consumers and brands has changed. Before the internet, inter um, consumers were faced by a very finite selection of retailers and brands that they could reasonably access. This was mostly because of physical boundaries. Did the retailer have a physical presence in the local area? Um, did they have a means of delivering its goods to the customer? And was the retailer able to promote its products or services to the customer in their area? So I remember this being problematic when I was younger and before e-commerce became the norm or before I was old enough to have access to a credit card. I had an inert sense of style that was not catered to within the places I could conceivably access. So I had no choice but to dress and style the way everyone else around me dressed, which in the late 90s and early 2000s in the smaller town I lived in by, by the sea, it was pretty much street or surfwear styles, nothing even slightly metropolitan. The internet profoundly changed this. Physical stores were no longer a necessity. The logistics of delivery became far simpler and online advertising was able to reach anyone anywhere with an internet connection at a far cheaper rate. This necessarily reduced the barriers to entry for retailers and brands and led to a far more competitive space where more and more of them were vying for consumer attention. Take the example of booking a summer holiday. Um, you might initially be inspired by a blogger or influencer whose photography and travel diary incite you to go to a particular destination. You might then search out more information on the destination and recommended local accommodation via an established Media Houses magazine or a community forum where fellow travellers have shared their experiences of visiting before. 
And to then ensure you are getting the best value for your money, you might go to a price comparison or meta search site or cashback or discount code site. All of these sites play an invaluable role in helping consumers find the right brand or product for them. And this concept around users' proactive engagement with such online arbitrators is becoming an increasingly important one in light of digital advertising's evolving relationship with personal data. Awin commissioned a consumer survey of 1,800 European consumers to find not only how often they turn to online sources to help them, but make purchases, or may, or help them make purchases, but also how important they are to them. The survey was both qualitative and quantitative. So not only did we want to understand how frequently shoppers interacted with affiliate content, we also wanted to know how important that content is in helping them to make better decisions. We also segmented consumers by age, so we were able to see there are universal trends or indeed trends that retailers need to be aware of when marketing to different age groups. By commissioning this survey, um, Awin hoped to get a better appreciation of how embedded affiliate content is in a typical shopping journey and the importance of retailers building stronger partnerships with publishers in order to both drive new customers and also cement loyalty through the relationship. So what did they find? Overall, two thirds of consumers have made use of them at least once in the last six months with price comparison sites being the most popular. There are clear age differences as well that show how brands appealing to different audiences have to be aware of the nuance in which partners they choose to focus their attention on. Take the over 60s. For them, only one in four believe specialist information sites have any importance in helping them with the buying decisions. For shoppers in the 18 to 32 year olds, that figure shoots up to six in 10. Inevitably in an age of young influencers, it should, it should come as no surprise that 18 to 32 year olds are twice as likely than the average to see social media as a starting point for their shopping experience. For the same age groups, twice as many younger consumers have made buying decisions based on discount sites, offering codes, coupons and offers compared to older shoppers. More broadly, while shoppers may not make use of them, a massive four in five consumers believe price comparison sites have an important role to play in informing them, with three quarters saying the same about coupon and voucher portals. The survey also found that a majority of shoppers wanted an ad funded um, or wanted ad funded content, that they preferred a world where these services are offered for free and paid for through advertising budgets. While overall the figure was 53%, this rose to an overwhelming 82% of 18 to 32 year olds, drawing a stark distinction between the ages. It's clear that millennials expect the internet to be free at point of access. The challenge for brands and marketers is how to walk the tricky tightrope in avoiding overstepping the mark when it comes to invading people's privacy and monetizing their personal data without user consent. Inevitably, and in an era of GDPR, we can expect programmatic and display to be on the receiving end of both regulators and a better informed public, with a backlash about how these businesses use personal data for marketing purposes. By contrast, affiliate marketing and marketing that involves partnerships with these online arbitrators, who have already built up trust with their audience, is much better suited to our privacy conscious era. Only the most basic data is tracked in order for affiliate tracking to function. And this makes the value exchange that sits at the heart of the online ad industry that much more palatable for consumers to accept. As our survey had showed, affiliates have cemented themselves at the heart of consumers purchase decisions. And without the need to use intrusive and overbearing uses of personal data, in fact, many of them have built user bases up in the millions. And much of this growth has been through word of mouth, positive growth through consumers wanting to let their friends and families know about new ways to shop. As someone representing the affiliate channel and a channel, channel I've been involved in uh, for the past 
13 years or more, I'm, I'm going to make a contrast between where other areas of digital are and where I believe an affiliate program done well can use those forms of data. I'd like to offer why I feel the affiliate channel is well-placed with the right narrative and supported by compelling stories to offer brands struggling with the new world. In a nutshell, it's data light in its purest form. By this, I mean we, when we as a business assess our use of personal data in our privacy impact assessments, we conclude it was largely confined to functional internal uses the ability to apportion sales to affiliates, the ability to detect potentially fraudulent patterns, the ability to distinguish between individual sales. Typically, affiliate networks and the general affiliate ecosystem never uses data to remarket, retarget, or personalize activity, which means one of the most problematic areas of digital marketing from a GDPR perspective is easier to deal with. From an explanatory point of view when talking to brands, the affiliate channel, again, in its purest form, is a simple transactional relationship. When you're happy, the sale a publisher has generated is valid and all above board, you make the payment. And finally, I think um, is the most transformational concept, one that if nothing else you can walk away with today, and that is, Unlike many thousands of vendors and third parties who operate in the digital ecosystem, many affiliates have direct conversations with consumers. They offer brands an opportunity to connect with customers in a way that few can and legitimately why affiliates should be treated with respect akin to any other member of your team. After, they are, after all, they are effectively an extension of your team. And this closeness to the consumer empowers them to create what is I think one of the most powerful concepts that um, we will hear, start to hear a lot more about, the development of the value exchange between brands, publishers, online entities, and their audiences. I will leave you on that note, and wherever in the world you are, I um, hope you and your loved ones are staying safe in these unprecedented times. Thank you.